Welcome to Lecture 3, Transportation's Role in Global Trade Execution. Today, we will have an overview of global freight flows and challenges, look at what 3PLs do, as well as find out how is freight prepared for movement. A direct service refers to a point-to-point -point service. It usually, but not always, means a journey of just a short distance. Both origin and destination must be directly accessible, and only a single mode of transportation is utilised with no intervening stop-offs. The single mode of transportation moves the cargo through both the export clearance at the country of origin as well as the import clearance at the destination country. An example of a direct service is overland trucking in the EU where there are several landlocked countries such as Hungary which share land borders with other neighbouring countries. An indirect service refers to a service which is broken into different segments. It typically covers relatively long distances. The origin and destination locations are not directly accessible by single mode of transportation, resulting in deployment of multiple modes with interim stop-offs and transfers between modes and carriers. A typical indirect service could involve cargo picked up by a truck from a seller for delivery to a port. Upon export clearance, the cargo is transferred to a ship or a plane for the line haul portion of the journey, which is likely the longest part. At the destination, the cargo goes through import clearance at the port and is then transferred to another truck for delivery to the buyer. The indirect service is also referred to as intermodal transportation. In global freight flows, virtually everything moving across an ocean would involve truck or rail carriers for product pickup and delivery and an air or ocean carrier for the line haul portion of the trip. Why is that so? Obviously, individual modes are not accessible at all locations. For example, most factories will not be located inside a port. As such, the goods produced need to be transferred by truck to the port for export overseas. The same applies at the destination country. Companies use any combination that best suits their freight requirements. Strategic use of intermodal transportation results in increased accessibility and cost efficiency, thereby facilitating global trade. Historically, freight is stored in ships in a random manner according to size, shape and weight. This is not efficient and leads to challenges in loading and unloading of the freight. The containerized freight concept started developing in the late 18th century with the use of non-standard simple wooden boxes mounted on horse-drawn wagons. Modern freight containers are of course mostly made of steel and painted with marine grade paint. They're extremely strong as they need to withstand strong conditions at sea and be stacked on top of each other while loaded with cargo. Containers come in various standard sizes and designs to suit different freight types. For example, general purpose or GP containers are very commonly used. Refrigerated or reefer containers are for temperature controlled goods. Isotanks are for gaseous and liquid commodities. Open top containers and flat rack containers are used for irregular sized cargo such as heavy equipment and machinery while car carriers are used for cars and other vehicles. The development of container standards in the 1960s contributed to the growth of containerization. Common dimensional height and width specifications for all seagoing containers made it possible to build standard transportation equipment to readily transport all containers globally. For transfer between different land locations, a container is mounted onto a chassis of the corresponding size. The loaded chassis is attached to a heavy vehicle known as a prime mover, which transports the empty containers to factories and warehouses for loading, as well as full containers from the seaport to the same locations for unloading. At the seaport, specialized giant forklifts move containers from one part of the port to another to position for loading onto vessels. Once the vessel has arrived and docked at the port, Heavy-duty cranes will lift the containers onto the vessel before it sails off to the next port of call. This entire flow of cargo would not have been possible if cargo did not come in standardized containers, which could be handled seamlessly in ports across the world. Next, let's look at how global freight flows. We know that the majority of freight is flowing from Asia to Europe, but there are various routing alternatives which can be taken. Routing number one is an all-water routing. It starts from Asia, 
crosses the Pacific Ocean and reaches the Panama Canal, a man-made 82 km waterway that connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific Ocean and which first opened in 1914. Once past the Atlantic Ocean, one would have arrived in Europe. Routing number two is a water land water routing. It starts from Asia, crosses the Pacific Ocean, and changes mode to cross the American continent over land. Finally, it changes mode again to cross the Atlantic Ocean to reach Europe. Routing number three is also an all-water routing. It starts from Asia, crosses the Indian Ocean, then reaches the Swiss Canal, another man-made waterway in Egypt that connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea, which first opened in 1869. Once past the Red Sea, one would have arrived in Europe. Routing number four is another water-land-water -water routing. It starts from Pacific harbors in Asia, crosses the Pacific Ocean to the Central Asian region, where it changes mode to cross Russia via the Trans-Siberian Railway. Depending on the destination country, there will usually be a further change to water, rail, or truck. Despite the transfers between modes, the intermodal transit times are typically half of all, all water services. This is because ocean vessel size limitations are avoided as ships do not have to use the Panama or Swiss canals. Ocean carriers utilizing all water routing also offer more frequent service and can use much larger ships. Supply chain disruptions can happen as a result of various factors such as congestion, equipment shortage, labor issues, and weather. Congestion, especially during peak demand periods at some ports, can result in delays of weeks. The ports are unable to clear containers from vessels fast enough due to the high volumes and shortages of material handling equipment. Strikes can further aggravate the situation. Bad weather such as blizzards, avalanches and heavy rain etc. can also bring activities to a standstill. Around 90% of world trade, whether finished goods or bulk materials, is carried by the international shipping industry. Without shipping, the import and export of goods on the scale necessary for modern world would not be possible. Container ships carry most of the world's manufactured goods and products. This is usually through liner services or ships that travel on regularly scheduled voyages following fixed routes with predetermined ports of call. Bulk carriers, the workhorses of the fleet, transport raw materials such as iron, ore and coal. They are easily identifiable by the hatches raised above deck level which cover the large cargo boats. Tankers transport crude oil, chemicals, and petroleum products. Tankers can appear similar to bulk carriers, but can be identified by oil pipelines and vents found on the deck. So how many containers can a container ship carry? HMM LG Siras, the world's largest container ship, arrived at the port of Hamburg on the 7th of June 2020 on her maiden voyage. This gigantic ship has a loading capacity of 24,000 TEUs. So which are the world's busiest seaports? Singapore comes in at number one, while six of the ports on the top ten list are from China. This is no surprise as China is the world's top production hub. Air cargo transports nearly 1% of world trade by volume. However, it is worth over US $6 trillion and accounts for 35% of world trade by value. Traditionally, customers pay a premium to transport high-value, time-sensitive goods that require superior protection while in transit. What are some examples of air cargo? For example, the US exports 1.61 billion worth of wine. Kenya exports 120,000 tons of cut flowers this year. 62,500 tons of humanitarian aid are delivered by air each year. Temperature and time sensitive vaccines are delivered speedily by air every year to save 2.5 million lives. So, which are the world's busiest cargo airports? Top of the list is Hong Kong International Airport while the rest of the top 10 shows a wide geographical spread from Anchorage in Alaska to Narita in Japan.
Moving materials within countries and across adjacent land borders within continents is the primary domain of trucks, rail and pipeline service. Trucking is clearly the major player for intracontinental freight flows, especially for America, Europe, India and China. For example, let's take a look at India, which has a land area of 3.287 million kilometers square, 4,500 times that of Singapore. India has the second largest road network in the world, spanning 5.89 million kilometers, transporting 64.5% of all goods in the country and 90% of total passenger traffic. Now, just a brief note on third-party logistics or 3PL companies. The complexity of global transportation makes it difficult for importers and exporters to plan and execute global freight flows. Thus, they often leverage on the expertise of 3PLs. These service providers facilitate the movement of goods via ocean, air and land by developing exceptional capabilities in the global freight flow process. 3PLs operate in different ways. International freight forwarders act something like tour agents. They book the best routes, modes of transport, and specific carriers for customers based on their individual requirements. Non-vessel owning common carriers or NVOCC act like grab shuttle. They book space on ships regularly at good rates. Then they resell this space to customers for small, less than container or LCL shipments, and they are often able to combine multiple customers' cargo into a single load to one common destination. In the final part of today's lecture, we will look at the key considerations when packing freight. Rule number one, sufficient information must be provided to enable freight handlers and receivers to identify the shipment. Rule number two, the packaging of the cargo must facilitate proper handling and protect the cargo from damage. Rule number three, all environmental and safety regulations for potentially hazardous materials must be strictly adhered to. Rule number four, all customs regulations of the destination country must be complied with. So what sort of information is required? For a start, the, the seller and the buyer must be clearly identified in terms of business name, address and country of origin. The weight and size of the cargo must also be specified in all freight documentation. Cautionary and handling markings, such as keep dry or fragile, has to be indicated using internationally recognized symbols. Hazardous materials marking following UN harmonized standards and internationally recognized dangerous group symbols must be prominently displayed on the cargo to alert all handlers to the potential hazards. As cargo is handled by many intermediaries during its journey, damage is always a very real concern. Various types of protective packaging can be used to minimize this risk. For sea shipments in particular, moisture is a great concern. Condensation can accumulate inside the container, and cargo may be unloaded in rain in an unsheltered foreign port. Thus, shippers often use moisture-resistant packaging material or protective plastic or string wrap to create moisture barriers to protect the cargo. To avoid unnecessary attention and increasing the risk of pilferage, it is also not uncommon for shippers to avoid writing descriptions of the products or their brand names on the cargo. Where possible, shippers will also use lightweight packaging materials. After all, they want to pay for shipping the product and not the excess weight caused by the packaging itself. Lastly, since shipping charges also take into consideration volume besides the weight, shippers must seek to use appropriate packaging to avoid paying for shipping air. Such a situation of shipping air is also a poor way of packaging goods as it can lead to cargo damage. Finally, we have come to the end of lecture 3 and that's all for now. See you next time.